So for the next few weeks, we're going to look at some people you may not have ever heard of in the Scripture. We're going to look at some that, I, <clears throat> frankly, we don't even know their name. But what we know about them is that they were ordinary, and God used them to have extraordinary impact. And the first one today is a woman who was a prostitute. She was a liar, and she was of a pagan people group that God had said he would judge because of their great iniquity. And yet she becomes an extraordinary impact in so many lives because of her one act of faith, one act of serving. Her name? Rahab. Go to Joshua chapter 2. Rahab. You probably read about her. At least heard about her. Joshua is the story of the conquest of the land of Canaan. Joshua really records the story of the leader, Joshua, after Moses is gone. They cross the river in the first three chapters, and then they begin to take Canaan, or the promised land. And as they take Canaan, there's a city, the first one they come to, that is a major obstacle. It's called Jericho. How many of you remember singing that song, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho? This is Jericho. Jericho was a walled city. I mean, it was fortified. If you remember back when God was in the wilderness with them, he told Moses to send 12 spies to the promised land because he wanted them to spy out the land and come back and give a good report. Well, they sent 12 spies. How many of them came back with a good report? Two. Only two. And the rest of the 10 said, there's no way we can take that land. And they, they named one thing that was formidable, walled cities. They also named giants and other things. But they said walled cities. This was the walled city they talked about, Jericho. And so as they're about to get into a battle with this city, Joshua is told of the Lord to send two spies. And so he sends the two spies to check it out. They happened upon a woman named Rahab. They stayed in her home. She hid them. And they said to her, Thank you, and we will deal kindly with you. And she said, Remember me when you come to take this city. And here is a sign. There will be a scarlet cord out my window. The very cord by which I let you down when you see that cord... The spies said, we will save those who are in that house. So it's, a, it's an incredible story. I mean, it's a movie quality. You could, you could just see this on the big screen. It's intriguing. It's got all this stuff. Now, let me tell you about Rahab. She is mentioned three times in the New Testament. In fact, one of the places where she's mentioned, there are only two women mentioned. And they're mentioned because of faith. That's in Hebrews chapter 11. There's also James chapter 2 where Rahab is mentioned in the same paragraph with Father Abraham. And she's mentioned because of her great faith. This book, Joshua, carries his name because it's usually about Joshua. She is the first character in the book to be talked about other than Joshua. So there's something about this ordinary prostitute from a pagan people who lied that God did amazing things. And I want you to read with me the story of an ordinary servant named Rahab. I'm reading from Joshua 2. The spies are sent. He says, go, to the, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came to the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab. And they lodged there. Verse 2. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you and who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men in and hidden them, and she said, True, men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, and you'll overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof. She hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. 
before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said, now here's what I want you to read carefully. You're about to read one of the greatest testimonies of a foreigner, somebody who was not of Israel, somebody who really was from one of the most evil people groups in the Old Testament. But listen to what she says. I know that the Lord has given you the land. How many of you, when you read that or when you look at that in the version of the Bible you use, Lord is all capital letters? Okay? Raise your hand if it's all caps. If it's uppercase, raise your hand. Then you got a great version. That's good. Because the reason versions do that is because they want to be very accurate, and that is always the word Yahweh in Hebrew. It's always the word Yahweh. So this prostitute from a pagan people group called the Amorites called him Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. That's the covenant name of God that he gave to his people. That's the one he gave to Moses at the burning bush. And she calls him the Lord. I got a question for you. Where'd she get that? How did she know his name? Just a thought. And also that the fear of you, meaning the people of Israel, has fallen upon us. And all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. Whoops. That would be her people. What you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And listen to this. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. How cool is that? We believe. We've heard about you. We've heard about your God. And when we heard our hearts melted within us, the Spirit left us. We had nothing left to fight. We know, we know your God is the God who reigns in the heavens, and he is the God of all. I mean, that's an incredible testimony from this woman. And then she goes into this deal. She says, now, what I want you to do for me, this is verse 12, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house, and you'll give me a sure sign that you're going to save alive my father and my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And here's what they plan to do. Then she let them down by a rope through the window. For her house was built into the city wall, and she lived in that wall. And she said to them, go into the hills. The pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you've made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And gather into your house your father, your mother, your brothers, and your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of doors of your house into, his own, into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. We will be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is in your house with you, his blood will be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now, whenever her name comes up, it's always in relation to faith, her faith. Jericho was a major city. It was a walled city. Notice she lived in the wall. Now, you don't live in a wall like we build around here, little walls. This was a walled city that was actually a city-state. That's why they had a king. It was that big and it was that prominent. 
Walls, archaeologists tell us there may have been double walls. They may have been 15 feet apart. So it's possible her, she lived inside of that space. She actually lived in the wall. Whenever she is talked about, she's talked about not where she lived as much as what she did, her faith. Because there was something in her that said, I'm going to serve you because I believe your God is the God of all gods. And I'm going to do this because I believe. This series that we're involved in called Ripple Effect is about serving. The whole theme for the year has been a passion to serve. But let me, let me narrow and define that for you just a little bit. It's not serving just to serve. It's serving with intention to give him glory. Because you know what makes us different than every other organization out there that just does random acts of kindness or serves the people? What makes you different is why you serve. You serve because you believe he is the God of all gods. You serve because you have believed in him. And so when Rahab is talked about, she's talked about her faith. So what was it about her faith? Well, first of all, it was unlikely faith. Look who she was. She was the most unlikely to believe in God and to literally do this because of who she was. First of all, she's an Amorite. I've already mentioned in Genesis, that was a group that would be judged, a people that would be judged because of their iniquity. So she's an Amorite. She is one of the enemies of the people of God. Number two, she's a prostitute. She's a prostitute. Now, it's real funny when you read commentaries on this because there are some commentators out there that just cannot bring themselves to say she was a prostitute. So they'll do this. They'll say the Hebrew word for prostitute is also a word for innkeeper. So it may have been she ran a bed and breakfast. <laughs> are you kidding me? Bed and breakfast? Hey, she was a prostitute. She wasn't a hotel keeper. This was not Motel 6. She left the light on, but it was a whole other reason. It, it was just <laughs> the fact that they don't like that God's Word would talk about a prostitute. That's God's Word. That's the beauty of it. That's what argues for the integrity and authenticity of this book is because God does not paint his heroes in colors of perfection. He just tells the story. She's just like us, worse. In fact... Take the Greek word. The, probably the greatest evidence for this is the grammar of the Greek. When the Greek Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, when you read this story in Greek, the word for her is porne. When you read Hebrews 11.31, where she appears in the roll call of the faithful, she is called the same word, porne. When you read James 2, verse 25, the Greek word is porne. Now, when I say the word porne, do I have to say any more about what she was? You hear it? She was a prostitute. She received men all the time. And it was very common for travelers to go there because she probably did open up her home for anybody who would come and want to stay. And let me tell you what I'm very intrigued with. What were the king's men doing hanging outside the room? Did you notice they're right there? They're the first ones to send a message to the king. Hey, we saw some men go into her house, and we think that they're men who've come. That's where the word came from. That's, what are they doing there? Oh, I know. They're secret service. <laughs> That's happened before, right? So there they were, serving their king. The biggest question to me is not what were they doing there. Here's the biggest question. How did the spies end up there? He sent two spies. I guess Joshua learned his lesson on sending 12. You know, you might as well rule out the 10 that give you a bad report. Let's just go with two this time. They sent two in. How did the spies end up there? Now, some would argue, well, it's not that uncommon maybe for travelers to come in and stay with this woman because she was very open to anyone who wanted to come and stay. I got another theory. God sent them. You know why? I believe God knew her faith. 
And he had heard the cries of this prostitute. And he knew that her heart melted at the sound of his name. And I just think God sent them and ordered their steps to this woman's house. Let me tell you something. You may not be known in this room to others, but I can tell you one that knows everything about you, and that is the God of the heavens and the earth. He knows you. Yeah, sinners might be off our radar. They're not off his. And he is passionately pursuing even the worst of those that we know and would think are beyond hope. God is pursuing them. He sent these spies to this woman to send a message of hope, to confirm her faith, and to let her know he was the God that she believed that he was. I think it's the most incredible story of God pursuing a sinner. When we were in India, a couple of missionaries were telling me a story of their work. Can't tell you where they were, but they were in a different area than they are now. But you know what they did? They lived in an area where human trafficking was really, really bad. And these young girls would be brought in, and they would be sold into sex slaves. And they ran, basically ran houses, just a brothel. And one of our missionaries, husband and wife, were so burdened for what they saw happening to these girls that they went down and rented a room at the brothel. And they held Bible study there. They held Bible study. And these girls would come not knowing what it was, and they would teach them the Bible. One night, the madam shows up. She listens to the Bible story. She's convinced that all the girls need to hear that, and she began to make all the girls come to this Bible study. Now the madam is a follower of Christ. Today, she's a follower of Christ. And you know what she's done? She said, you can have everything here you want. Now, this happened even before she became a follower of Christ. I'm thinking to myself as they're telling me this story, wow, man, our cooperative program dollars at work, this is, this is really interesting. wonder what would happen if all the folks back home knew how the money is being spent. Well, I can tell you what this folk will do, and I think I can tell you what these folks will do gathered here. We will praise the Lord for somebody who had the guts to go in a brothel to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? They wanted to go and bring the light. So here, here's this incredible moment where God sends two of his servants and he sends them into that house. Why? Because there was faith there and he wanted to confirm and encourage her. She's a prostitute. She's of the Amorites. And then she's a liar. You notice she lied. Did that just go right over everybody's head? She lied. The king's men came to her and said, hey, where are they? And she said, well, you know, I... I did have some guys come in, but I sent them out. And so if you leave right now, you might can catch them. <laughs> and all the while, they were upstairs hidden under the flax. Evidently, she had other work going on in the place. And she had flax that she was sorting out, and she hid them in the flax. Now, this poses a big problem for us. Rahab lied. What are we to do with a liar? Well, let me just tell you this. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated because she did lie, but I'm going to tell you something. She's not the only one. Abraham lied. There are stories, I mean story after story, of people who did not represent the truth. And you notice that the Scripture never condones it, but it's as almost as if in those moments... There's this picture of the reality that, yes, we are all sinners. And, yes, we lie. Yes, we sin. Yes, we're not perfect. And here's the interesting thing about her. Look at why she lied. She lied because she had a greater fear of God than she did of her own king. She wasn't afraid of the lie of the king, but she wasn't about to lie to God. She had a greater fear of God. And there is and there are moments when you have to say to a higher authority, I will obey you rather than man. And I know that's a slippery slope, but it's one we got to wrestle with because Corey Ten Boom, one of the greatest saints in Christianity, hid Jews in her house to protect them during the Holocaust and lied to the Germans about where they were. And I'll be glad to let you walk up to Corey Ten Boom and tell her she was wrong. You can have at it when you see her in heaven one day. 
I'm just telling you, there is the wrestling of these kinds of issues with people in the Scripture who weren't perfect, who didn't always get it right. But what God does, He tells you the whole story so He can show you His amazing ability to use messed up people. Messed up people just like us. In fact, Paul, Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Listen to what Paul wrote. This is 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to your worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He's the source of your life in Christ, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let one, the one who boasts, boast only in the Lord. What that verse is telling me is that the reason God chose you is not because he was impressed with you. It's because he loves you. You are scarred. You are sinful. You are broken just like the rest of humanity. But God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So here's this beautiful picture of the ripple effect. It happens with people who are not perfect. When that pebble is thrown in and the ripples happen, that pebble can be scarred, broken, all messed up. But God has an amazing ability to use you and to use me, just like Rahab. Unlikely faith. Second thing, courageous faith. You know what? Faith that's real, faith that's authentic, is willing to risk. She risked everything. Think about it. She risked everything. In other words, she said, you know what? I got a choice here. I can hide these spies and put my trust in a God that I've never seen. Or I will die if the king finds out. Or I can send them on their own and refuse to follow and trust. And you know what her choice was? I'll risk it all. And you know why she risked it? Because she believed in the God she heard about. She believed in the God she heard about. So that's why she was willing to risk. Is that, not, is that not why we follow Christ? Is that not why we risk what we risk? It's because we believe. I mean, think about it. Her hope was in God. Because if there wasn't a people and they didn't come to get Jericho and destroy Jericho, she's dead. Because she's going to be found out and it's over. But you know what? She believed and said, I consider it worth the risk. When I read the story of Rahab, I keep thinking about what are we risking. In fact, let me ask it this way. How much faith does it take to live the way you're living? I mean, how much faith, real faith, does it take to live the way you're living? You see, think for, I think for American Christians, and especially in affluent places like we live in central Florida, I think it takes very little faith. In fact, we don't risk much at all. Oh, we may risk a bad email. We may risk somebody getting upset and telling jokes about us in the break room. We might risk some students making fun of us because we talk about Jesus. But the risk is very, very low. That's why I encourage you to read The Insanity of God because there are brothers and sisters today who are risking their life because they love Jesus just like we do. And I think Rahab is one of those who said, you know what, I believe this God and I'm willing to risk everything. And after all, isn't that what following Christ is about? Isn't it about following him and risking our own life? Look what Jesus said, and I included it in your listening guide just so you would have it. Jesus said this in Mark 8. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What's happened sometimes in the American church, I feel like we've declawed the line of Judah. He's become a house pet instead of the lion that he is. It is not safe to follow Christ. I can't stand here and tell you that if you give your life to Christ, you will be safe and everything will work out and everything will be wonderful because that's not the Scripture. I know there are prosperity teachers all across this country that will tell you that if you give your life to Christ and become a Christian, you're going to drive a Beamer and you're going to live in a nice car. I mean, like, yeah, you better live in that car. You're going to drive a beamer. You're going to live in a nice home. You're going to whatever. 
And I'm telling you, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of man, not Christ. The call to follow Christ is a call to risk. The safest place for an airplane, you know where it is? In a hangar. That's right. That's the safest place. But do they build planes to sit in a hangar? The safest place for a ship is where? In a harbor. But do you build a ship to sit in a harbor? You know where the safest place for your car is? In your garage. And you know where that's the safest place for us is your car in your garage. We're all much safer, right? But you don't buy a car to sit in the garage. You don't buy a plane or build a plane to sit in a hangar. You build it to fly. Jesus didn't come and give his life so you could sit and play it safe. He gave his life so you could radically follow our king and risk your life for him. That's the call of Christ. That's what Rahab demonstrates is a courageous faith. And I think that's the faith God approves. That's the one he honors. In fact, Jesus tells a parable of the master and the talents, and he gives one man five talents, one man two talents, one man one talent. And Jesus said, one day the master comes back and says to the guy with five, hey, what'd you do with the money I gave you? And the man said, I went out and I invested. I got five more talents to go with it. And Jesus said, well done. He went to the man that had two. What'd you do with yours? Well, I went out and I invested and I risked it. And I got two more. He came to the guy that had one. He said, what'd you do with yours? And he said, well, I knew that you were a master who might show up at any time, and you're a very hard man, so I hid it. I played it safe. I buried it. And the master looked at him and said, how dare you? Took the talent away and cast the servant away. Have you ever thought the only one who lost in that parable is the guy who played it safe? I'm calling you out. Quit playing it safe for Christ. Follow radically. Follow with the faith of Rahab. Courageous faith. And the last thing, saving faith. Saving faith. Now, exactly what, what are we talking about saving faith? Well, I think that the reason the spies went to her is because God knew she had faith. I said that a moment ago. When Rahab is talked about in James chapter 2, she's talked about as having faith. In fact, James, let's just turn there. James uses her as an example of faith like Abraham. Now, let me just give you context to what we're going to read in James 2, 25. James is talking about saving faith and what it does. Yes, there are people in history who didn't like the book of James. One is Martin Luther. He called it a right straw epistle. And there are others who have said James was talking about being saved by works. I've even read today commentators who struggle with the book of James because they think that James is saying you're saved by works. That is not what James teaches. Anybody that will just spend a little time in the book will realize he is not saying that at all. Watch this. If this is a line down the center of this room, and up here is the timeline of your life, and this line represents the conversion moment. That's the moment you're saved, okay? Over here is the day you're born. So you're walking along in life, you hear the gospel, you respond to the gospel, your life has changed, Jesus Christ lives in you now, you are saved, you're at this line. On the other side of this line is your life after you become a follower of Christ as a Christian. What Paul is doing in the books and letters that he wrote, he's standing on this side of the line looking back saying, you don't get to this line by works. You don't get to this line because you've been good. You can't work your way into heaven. You're not saved by works. James is standing back to back with Paul, talking to folks over here saying, if you are truly saved, where is the evidence? Because faith without works is dead. So if you're truly on this side of the line, there ought to be some evidence that you look like Jesus, that you're doing things that Christ would do. Where's the evidence? So see, they're both back to back. And they're both giving us the whole picture of the gospel. We've spent a whole lot of time as Baptists working on people over here saying, nope, you can't get saved by works, can't get saved by works. And then it's like we forget about what happens after you cross the line and we just tell people to sit and everything will be all right. You're going to heaven one day. It's all good. No, it isn't. Because if he radically changed your life, how do you not do anything? How do you not evidence love? How do you not evidence this faith? So Rahab. 
according to James, is an example of somebody who lived out her faith. And so read with me, James chapter 2, this is verse 25. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and she sent them out another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now here's something you got to care, stay with me. Rahab did what she did because she believed. She didn't believe after she did it. She believed before she did it. In fact, that's why she did it. The scarlet rope that she was to put out of her window and leave it there so that when they came to Jericho to take Jericho, they would see the rope and they would know that they're going to save all those in her house. Her faith was not in that rope. That rope was not the object of her faith. It was the evidence of it. The reason she put a rope out the window was to say, hey, nothing's changed. I still believe. The reason you and I serve is not that we might be saved. It's that we already are saved. You see the difference? It's saving faith. It's what it looks like. So you're going to be asked to do something each week. You're going to be asked to do random things. I mean, you're going to be, there are all kind of little projects that we're going to give you along the way that you can serve somebody. And let me just tell you, the reason for all of it is because you are a follower of Christ. It is what we do because it's who we are. Rahab had saving faith. My prayer for the church, especially the American church, is that we will demonstrate our faith by the way we live out our lives in this country, in this culture. That's what Rahab did. She hung the rope out. What a beautiful thing. I mean, you got to get this picture. There's a scarlet rope, and many have seen in that scarlet rope this picture of the blood of Christ all through Scripture, and I think it fits. I do. I think it's a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ. But, But the only difference is she didn't look to the rope for salvation. The rope hanging out the window was the evidence that she was a believer. She did believe in God. So that rope was almost like baptism. Think about it. Why is a person baptized? Are they baptized to be saved? No. They're baptized because they are saved, and they're not ashamed of Jesus. Can you imagine how many people would walk? (laughs) This is, think about it. My mind just goes places like this. Can you imagine how many people in Jericho walk by that apartment or that house and goes, what in the world is that rope doing there? Hey, Rahab. What's the rope mean? She said, well, it means nothing to you, but it means everything to me. And maybe she did take it upon herself to tell somebody exactly what it meant. But she wasn't ashamed to hang that rope out the window because you know what? She had made her faith secure. She believed, and she was ready for him to come and save her life. When a person is baptized, it's like saying, I'm hanging the rope out for everybody to see. I know who my Savior is. I know who my God is. Let me show you this picture. I want you to look at this picture up there of baptism. You notice that looks like a hole in the, uh, kind of in the ground, and that's exactly what it is. One of our missionaries sent this to me because they know how we celebrate baptism here. I tell the story everywhere I go about this church and how we celebrate baptism. I said it's like a party. It's like somebody scored a touchdown whenever we baptize here, which is the way it ought to be. And so this missionary sent me this and said, I love what you're doing there, but I can tell you where we are, we can't celebrate like that. Because where we are, it's against the law to be a Christian. And when people follow Christ, it's at great risk. But they want the world to know and they want us to know they're not ashamed and they're willing to do that even though it's going to risk their life. Watch this. See that girl? That's in a house. Normally, you see there's a cover on that. It looks like that cover comes down on hinges. And, and he said that what happens is they keep it covered with a, with a rug over it. You'd never know that baptistry's there. But when somebody gives their heart to, to, to Christ and they want to follow in faith, in baptism, they, raise, they bring the rug back and they pull it up. So they leave the water in there all the time. Well, this is a very cold place. He said the water was so cold that day that this young lady, this is a teenage girl, it was so cold she passed out in the water. And that is a picture of the pastor holding her up because of the frigid water. She literally collapsed. 
But the reason she did it is because she was not ashamed. They have to have people outside that house watching for activity because if some of the radical extremists, they hear about a baptism, they'll come and they'll kill every one of them on the spot. When I think about that, and I think about our baptism, how different it is. But in both cases, it's the sign that we are followers of Christ, just like that rope hanging out. It's a sign, I am a believer. And when you come to tear this place down, remember, my faith is in God. So she had courageous faith. She had saving faith. She had unlikely faith. And what was the result of it? What was the end result? Extraordinary. Here's what happened because of Rahab's faith. Think about all the impact she had. Number one, her whole family was saved. I want you to look at Joshua 6 with me. Joshua 6 is literally the story of what happens when they came to tear the city down. You remember how they did it? They walked around the city, and they walked around every day for six days. On the seventh day, they walked around how many times? Seven times. And on the seventh time, they sounded the trumpet blast, and when they did, the city came tumbling down. Don't you imagine as they walked around, those spies would look up there and see that scarlet cord, and they would look at one another and say, she believes. And on the day they were to destroy that, I want you to listen to what Joshua said to those spies. He said to them, go get her. Go get everybody in that house so that the promise you made will be fulfilled because we know they believe we see the scarlet cord. Read this with me, chapter 6. This is verse uh, 17. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Verse 22. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house. Bring her out from there and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. They burned the city with fire and everything in it. But Rahab the prostitute, verse 25, and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day. Because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. What a moment that was. On that seventh trip around, Joshua said, go get her. She believes. And they walked in and led everybody in her house. Remember the spies said, now if they're outside your house, we don't save them. If they're inside the house, we're saving them. Can you imagine what it was like for Rahab to stand with her family? as they watched Jericho burn as it fell. Can you imagine one of her family members walking over to her, her mother, her brother, saying, thank you for telling us about this God. Thank you for sparing our life. Do you know where your ripple effect first begins? With those closest to you. With those right around you. Rahab's family were saved. I just can't believe what that must have been like when they watched their city burn and they're thinking to themselves, Rahab saved us. It was her influence, it was her impact that caused us to be alive today. So maybe the first place that you look to serve is that ripple around your family. So her family was saved. Another impact was she's mentioned in the New Testament three times. And the last impact is the one that gets me. When you read Matthew 1, verse 5, that is the genealogy of Christ. That's the lineage of Jesus. That's basically who begat who and how they all ended up before Jesus came. You know who's in that list? Rahab. Rahab. Rahab, because of this one act of faith, this one act of service by hiding the spies, she is now in the history of God bringing Jesus to this world. She is now the great, great grandmother of David, King David. She married Solomon. Some believe Solomon was one of the spies. She married him, not Joshua. A lot of Jewish tradition says she married Joshua. She didn't marry Joshua. She married Solomon. 
Matthew 1.5. Think about it. Every time the gospel is read, every time Matthew is read, the name Rahab is said. All because of one thing. That act of hiding the spies was a small thing. But the ripple effect was huge. Think about what could happen in the things we do. Think about the impact you could have. You said, me? Yes. Remember, prostitute, liar, Amorite. You're not worse than that. Think about what would happen if we did just small things. Let me tell you what a lady handed me this morning. She walked up to me. She said, Pastor, I've been thinking about these little acts of kindness and, and I did something, and, and I wrote the note, and I said it was from Jesus, and so I, I just want you to know what happened. And I said, what would you do? She said, I baked some banana bread for my mailman. <laughs> really? And I left him a note. Told him it was from the Lord. And then she looked at me, and she said, and he wrote me this. Now, guys, this is a mailman. This is a piece of banana, I mean a, a banana bread loaf. Listen to the impact. Hey, and then he uses her name. I'll keep it anonymous. I really wish you'd been home today because I wanted to tell you how much that card meant to me yesterday. I've been going through some tough times lately. And yesterday, I prayed real hard to God to help me get, give, give me the strength to just get through the day. And guess what? He did. And you were the angel who delivered the message that I was going to be okay. God works in many ways. Thank you. P.S. The banana bread was great. <laughs> now, guys, who would have thought just a loaf of banana bread? But she wrote in the note, this is from the Lord. And that very morning, he had prayed, Lord, give me a sign. You think that happened accidentally? No. You see, Rahab did what she did because she believed. So what we're going to call you to do in the weeks to come is because of faith. It's because we believe. It's for Jesus. I was in Great Falls, Montana the other day, about two weeks ago. John, in fact, John Mark, some of the worship team went up and we did their convention. They have a convention for all the pastors to come to and we were the, the guest who spoke and who led the worship. And so while I'm in Great Falls, I'm, I'm freezing to death. Freezing, 50 degrees, but I'm freezing to death. <laughs> and the wind's blowing about 30 miles an hour. And they were all laughing at me. And I said, you know what they call this in Central Florida? And I, they said, what? I said, the dead of winter. This is terrible. <laughs> I stopped to get a bottle of water before I spoke one night, and the little girl behind the cash register said, Hey, sir, would you like to participate in raising money to help some, some uh, children with uh, disease and illness? And I said, Well, yeah, sure. What do I do? She said, Well, you just give a dollar, but you get to put on this, this little thing your name, and we see them over there. And she pointed, and there was a wall that had all these displayed. You've seen it where you get to write your name in. I said, Sure, give me one. And I just wrote this from Jesus and I pushed it back over there she looked down she looked up she looked back down <laughs> and I'm standing there thinking to myself okay what do I say here is she thinking are you Jesus <laughs> and then she just kind of smiled and the reason I did it is because, as Rachel and I have tried to tell our children, whenever you stop and help somebody, you do it in one name, the name of Jesus. It's from him. It's for him. So that the impact is what? For his kingdom. Otherwise, you're just like everybody else doing good things out there for some reason. I want them to know the reason. It's Jesus. This guy over here, when you get off I-4 at John Young, that stands there, that, that has his sign, we, we're on a first-name basis. We, we talk every day because I pull, I exit, and I give him money. And every time, he knows exactly what's coming. I said, hey, this is from Jesus. He wanted me to tell you he loves you. So I'm asking you, 
Whatever God puts in your heart to do, do it from Jesus so that the effect is eternal. Because you never know, just like this, what if we were to all bake banana bread and give to our mailman this week? Well, I can tell you, if I bake banana bread, my mailman will never speak to me again. I, I promise you. <laughs> never. But what if we did something like that? What if you found a way? So let's start with something really simple, okay? Real simple. In the back of the, uh, the pew there, there's some cards that look like this. Now, these have always been there. Passion to serve, prayer request, guest card, and then giving envelope. But we've added one. It's called thank you. What if today we take this card, and by the way, they'll be here every week. These cards will be in here every week. What if you wrote thank you, a little note to somebody who has blessed you, who has served you? Could have been something as simple as they greeted you at the door. Could be something like they take care of your children when you drop them off in preschool. In other words, just a way of saying, I appreciate what I see. Your serving has an impact. There is a ripple effect. And what you're doing has blessed me, and I want you to know it. So what I want you to do this morning, before you leave the property, I want you to just take this card, and I just want you to write a little note to somebody. You know what could be the person you need to write to? The one who sits in the pew behind you, or in front of you, or beside you. You see them every week. And I don't know if we do this often. I know we don't do it enough. Have we ever just thanked one another for being here? Hey, thank you for being here today because it encourages me. That might, you don't even know their name. You don't have to know their name. Just write a note saying, you know what? You, you bless me. I look at you and I watch you worship and I'm just so encouraged. Thank you and hand it to them. Every week for the next several weeks, I want you to use these cards and I want you to thank somebody because I believe that people like Rahab, their story lives on and on and on and the impact is extraordinary. So this morning we're going to start. I want you to bow your head with me just a moment. I want you to ask the Lord right now, Lord, who is it that I need to say thank you to? Who is it that I need to serve? And God, today, help me to understand that you use ordinary servants like me to have extraordinary impact. And I'm willing today, God, for you to use me. Father, I just can't help but think, what if? What if we as the followers of Christ at First Baptist were to begin to serve at a whole new level? And we do it in Jesus' name. And we do it for the gospel. What could happen? God, I pray that it will. And it does. So even today, Lord, before we leave, there's somebody that's blessed us. May we tell them. And thank you, Father, that everything we do in Jesus' name matters. The smallest pebble still makes a ripple. The smallest act of faith and obedience has a lasting effect. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.